Introducing the top four levels of engagement. Now that you're familiar with the lower levels of Amanda Slavin's seventh level engagement framework, let's talk through the top four levels of the framework. Level four, structure dependent engagement. Level five, self-regulated interest. Level six, critical engagement. And finally, the top level, level seven, literate thinking. These top four levels can be divided into two buckets. Levels four and five, structure dependent engagement and self-regulated interest are most closely tied to the engage stage in the inbound methodology. The engage stage is all about connection. It's where you build relationships with your leads and customers by engaging with them on their terms. Leads and customers who fall into these levels are now based on connecting and communicating and actually asking for something from your audience. Level six and seven, critical engagement and literate thinking are most closely tied to the delight stage in the inbound methodology. In the delight stage, you're shifting your resources to help tie your business's success directly to your customer's success. Level four, structure dependent engagement. This is the lowest level of the top four levels in Amanda Slavin's seventh level engagement framework. Structure dependent engagement means your audience is taking structured instructional actions, but aren't taking action or engaging with your brand organically. As a kid, when you're in the class, sometimes your teacher, I would do this as a teacher, I would ask my class, um, everybody tell me what time it is. They were six. So I would ask the entire class to say something together. So in that component, you're not actually really scared. I'm not calling on a person. And as a group, you're able to actually communicate it. And so even if you might not know the answer, you're able to kind of be like three, you feel included, you feel a part of it. Um, you're not, you're not again, deeply connected to providing the answer because you're not sacrificing anything. You're not raising your hand, but you're a part of a group activity. That's very easy to do. Now going into an action in marketing. Structure dependent actions are as simple as Comment on this post if you want a free ticket. Tag your friend if you're interested in attending this experience. Share your email if you want a free download. They're very structure, instructional experiences that are asking a customer to provide something to you without sacrificing their own brand. And so you cannot ask an individual to share on behalf of your brand if they don't, again, even know what you stand for or who you are. So you start off with small actions. And this, to me, is how you get a lot of people engaging with your brand. I will talk a little bit more about sweepstakes and where those fit in, but sweepstakes also fit into this structure-dependent role as long as you're asking for a very simple response, such as give us your email, tag a friend, comment, etc. Structure-dependent engagement is all about engaging people by providing specific instructions for them to engage. Your audience might be willing to take action only because you've given them clear, simple instructions. Their willingness structure-dependent engagement. How can you work with it? So what metrics can you use to identify structure-dependent engagement? And how can you increase engagement with your audience without having to provide structure? To measure structure-dependent engagement, track the shares and comments on your social media posts, emails, and blogs. Are people only commenting, sharing, and tagging friends on content when you specifically ask them to, or are these actions happening organically? Experiment with different types of social media posts to see what drives people to engage with your content. Now, asking for comments or likes in your social media posts isn't a bad thing. In fact, it can be a great way to engage folks who don't know you very well yet. It's just important to recognize that when people engage with your posts because you ask for it, it doesn't necessarily indicate that they're super highly engaged. So with Instagram, if you were to think of structure dependent engagement, the way that you could attract customers is by creating campaigns that are easy for a person to provide something to you. So you can do something along the lines of a sweepstakes with a series of partners that makes sense to your brand values, and then asking people to tag a friend in order to be able to win the sweepstakes. Or you can say, follow 
follow our channel in order to be able to participate in this experience that we've provided for you. Or it can be as simple as, again, click the link in our Instagram in order to be able to give us your email to win something down the road. I'm using winning as an opportunity because generally sweepstakes work really, really well on Instagram. And the tagging component is a, is a really easy metric to be able to ensure that you are gaining new customers. So that to me is the way you would use Instagram. The one thing I'd also say with structured dependent engagement and social media and just going back to blogging is you can take those blogs and have it be attached to some type of downloadable PDF or resource. And then you can leverage social media to be able to promote and amplify the blog and say something like, if you want this tool based on targeting the right people with the right message and the right voice, if you want this tool, give us your email. And then that can also be a way you're leveraging social media, structured dependent engagement with SEO, with the right messaging, amplifying a product or resource you have to give for free to your audience. For social media, particularly around Instagram, I would focus on metrics with how many comments are you receiving Again, it's very specific to the campaign. So if you're focused on, hey, comment below, how many comments are you receiving? If you're focused on, hey, follow me, how many followers are you receiving? If you're focused on giving away a resource, how many emails are you receiving? So really making the KPI very specific to the campaign that you're providing and then the call to action very specific to the KPI. I would say with email marketing, you need to also ensure again that you're having the right messaging and that you're talking to the right people. But let's take it one step further. So every time I do refer to a higher level, I am assuming that you have already achieved the lower levels below that level. That's a very important thing to note. So if I'm talking about something at the higher levels, you should have already identified the right messaging, identified the right customer, sent the right proper messaging to that customer, and now we can talk about higher levels with that customer. So for email marketing, the way that I would think about it is being able to ensure that your customers are split into groups based on their interactions and experiences with you. As I've mentioned a lot in this experience, don't ask me to marry you before you before I go on a date with you. If you're going to send an email to me, I would very much recommend putting me in a bucket, whether that be first touch point. This is someone that I've just interacted with for the first time. They gave me an email through a structured dependent campaign. Now what am I going to do with them and have an action there? If it's the other action, this idea of, okay, now we know that they're interested because they've given us their email, but we don't really know them yet. So now we're going to ask them questions on their interest. What are they passionate about? What are they inspired by? In order to then be able to use email as a mechanism to possibly target them with things that they're interested in, such as influencer partnerships or sweepstakes or brand partnerships, things that we actually know about that we're going to gather information and in a very transparent way, we're going to explain to them that we want to get to know them more. And we're going to ask them questions to guide them through the process so that we can then deliver them messages that they're actually looking for, which would be self-regulated interest. So those would be kind of the two ways that I would look at emails, separate your audience based on where they are, ensure that you're providing the right messaging to them, and you're really going to usually get their emails through a structured dependent experience, and then ensure that you're finding out information from them so that you can speak to them like they're a human being. Some really good examples of this is when you receive an email and you get to choose the topics that you're passionate about or you're interested in. So it feels like the user is actually in control. And then you're actually asking the individual what they're interested in and then providing that service to them. So you have to be really strategic within this level because people also don't want to give you anything if they don't really know who you are. So again, you have to ensure the three levels below this are met and then come up with a strategic framework to get someone excited enough to want to actually give their email address, comment a friend, or comment themselves. Structured Dependent Engagement is all about engaging with your audience in structured instructional ways. It is level five, self-regulated interest. With self-regulated interest, we're getting closer and closer to the higher levels. Self-regulated interest means your audience is engaging with your brand purely for self-interested reasons, not because of an interest in your brand. This usually happens when your brand partners with another brand or a celebrity on a campaign to drive awareness and engagement, or when your brand does a giveaway that would draw engagement for self-interested reasons. Now we are going to be talking about self-regulated interest. So as a child, 
when you were in class, a class that you really didn't like again. I keep kind of bashing school, but for me, it was it was very difficult for me to enjoy the subjects that I was learning about. And if I didn't necessarily like a class and a teacher told me that if I came to class every single day, I would get five extra credit points, I would generally do it. Because even if I didn't like the class, it actually would excite me because I would be self-interested in getting a better grade without having to do a lot of work. And that would be coming to class every single day. And that five points, for those who don't remember, is like a full grade. I mean, you could go from a B to an A or a C to a B, like it was a big opportunity. But it was all based on my self-interest. It was nothing to really do with my passion or inspiration around the subject. It was something that was serving me. Now in marketing, uh, I use the example of if a smoothie company decided to partner with a celebrity, a traditional endorsement deal, nowadays influencer marketing, uh, or even a partnership agreement where it was something around, let's just say, basketball. And they targeted me because they knew that I liked basketball. So now again, going back, this brand is doing things based on the findings from previous levels. They're targeting me with the right messaging. They're ensuring that they're on the right platform. They have already received something from me, whether it be my email or an Instagram. And now they're serving up an ad for me that actually makes sense because they've ensured that all of those bottom levels are not there to me as a customer. And I'm at this higher level of engagement. And they serve an ad for me that's around coming to an event with LeBron James, uh, and it's about possibly winning a pair of sneakers he wore at a basketball game. And I love basketball. I am going to go to that event. If I go to that event, I am going to go to that event because I love basketball and LeBron James. I may or may not remember the smoothie company that invited me to the event. If I get to the event and the smoothie company does an incredible job and a real it creates a really integrated experience where that smoothie is front and center and it makes perfect sense to me why they have partnered with this basketball player and then they create an opportunity for me to further connect with the experience, then there's an opportunity to increase that level of engagement. But generally, brands have these endorsement deals like huge celebrities drinking Sprite or Gatorade or, you know, again, partnerships that to me might not make any sense to acquire new customers based on their interests. It really has nothing to do with my passion for the brand. It has everything to do with what this is going to do for me. That is self-regulated interest. I am interested not in the brand, but in the action associated with what the brand is offering me. It's excitement, it's personal excitement, and it's based on my own interests. So that's self-regulated interest. While campaigns like celebrity appearances may appeal to large numbers of people in your target audience, keep in mind that those people may not even know or care that your brand is even connected to the campaign. Self-regulated interest, how can you work with it? Let's talk about which metrics you can use to identify whether your audience is engaging because of self-regulated interest and how to move people up to higher levels of engagement. The folks in your audience who are at this level are pretty engaged, which is great, but it's important to remember here that even though they might be emotionally connected to the campaign, it doesn't necessarily mean they're emotionally connected to your brand. And that's the ultimate goal here. So to move them up from this level, you need to make sure you're very clearly connecting the partners, influencers, and prizes you're offering to your audience with your brand's identity and values. Are these partnerships and campaigns helping people understand your brand better? Are you making sure the campaign provides an end-to-end -end experience that helps participants become loyalists in the future? That's the kind of messaging that's going to connect emotionally with your audience and get them to the next level. To measure self-regulated interest, it's all about retention. If you're giving away a car at an event or bringing in a celebrity, the real question you should be asking yourself is, are you doing a good enough job at communicating how this giveaway or this celebrity appearance is connected with your brand values to retain those participants after the campaign or the event is over? Measure this by looking at the retention rates from that campaign or event, whether it's signups, subscribers, followers, or buyers. Once these people take an action, do they stick with you? Or do you notice a drop off in subscribers, followers, or buyers within say 30 days of the close of the campaign or event? Questions I would ask would be, 
Am I partnering with the right partners that are intrinsically a part of my values? Am I integrating these partnerships enough where individuals will actually know about what my brand represents and what it stands for? Am I creating and leveraging content that is really about my brand with these partnerships so that it always is going back to my brand? And then am I recognizing that these customers I'm attracting could be loyal down the road or am I just settling for a bunch of people following my Instagram account because this influencer that they like told them to follow it, which will generally lead to an unfollow the next day. Goals would be retention of customers in my mind. So this would be being able to set goals that would say, if I were to do a campaign with influencers, are these individuals not just increased in followers, but continued followers for a series of time or point of time? Another goal that I would set would be, again, um, some type of product. So is this, are we creating content together? Are we creating, you know, an integrated product together? What are we actually creating as a product? And how are we going to measure the success of that product, whether that be sales or whether that be some type of, you know, traction of marketing traction. But in my mind, having something tangible between a partnership that will actually support your brand or you're going to get a bunch of kids that want extra credit but don't actually care about the subject. Level six, critical engagement. Now we're getting into the top two levels of the seventh level engagement framework, critical engagement and literate thinking. Remember, these two levels are about delighting your customers, which means focusing on customer attention and customer loyalty. This is where you help your audience transition from simply fans and customers to active brand advocates. Critical engagement means your audience is engaged with you on an emotional level and believes your brand understands and cares about their goals. This goes beyond the product and allows for brand loyalty. So now we're going to be talking about critical engagement. So as a child, uh, if you had a really, really good teacher, the teacher would notice you and the teacher would help guide you to what you're actually looking for kind of move this towards when you're in high school and you're looking for a college, your guidance counselor is really good at critical engagement. Your guidance counselor helps you set goals that transforms your life. That's critical engagement. She or he sits with you, asks you questions about what you're looking for from your life, helps you choose a college, and you're sitting in her room that you probably never thought you would actually be in. You didn't even know where the door was when you were, you know, freshman and sophomore. And now you're sitting there for hours at a time because she or he is helping you with your goals. And you're setting your own goals because of this person. This person is asking you questions and guiding you to actually being able to set goals for yourself that will truly transform the rest of your life. Do you want to go to college? Do you not want to go to college? Do you want to stay here? Do you want to go across the country? Questions that are truly about what you want, what you're passionate about, and inspiring you to take some type of action in your own life. Like an inspiring guidance counselor, brands that are able to inspire their audience to set goals and make changes in their lives have achieved a very high level of engagement with their audience. Critical engagement is rooted in that ability to inspire. Brands that achieve critical engagement with portions of their audience know their own values really well themselves and are able to connect their audience to those values too. For critical engagement, I want to give a, an example with a brand that does this very well. There's something called Black Friday, and Black Friday is a day where everyone goes shopping like a crazy person. They literally, there's sales, flash sales all over the country, online, offline, really, really crazy sales. So from like 100% of the actual price to 20% of the price. REI is a brand that's a very outdoorsy brand. So they sell, you know, camping gear and clothing, and they did a tremendous campaign during Black Friday. They stood for something. What they did was they said, we are going to close all of our stores on Black Friday, this day where most stores were hoping to make you know, months worth of sales. And instead of actually opening our stores to the public, we wanna create a campaign that inspires people to go outside. What we stand for, we stand for being outside in nature, respecting nature, being with your loved ones in the outdoors. We want you to do that. And we're actually going to take a personal hit, a personal sacrifice so that you can know our goals that we're setting to transform our culture and our lives and inspire you to do the same. And so they created a campaign called Opt Outside. 
They created a website, had all of these people all over the world share their inspirational stories of opting outside on Black Friday instead of shopping and being with their loved ones in the outdoors. Uh, and now every single year, what ends up happening is these people that are unbelievably loyal to REI and maybe, by the way, didn't know REI to begin with, now opt outside instead of going shopping on Black Friday. What they did was they changed culture. They changed the way people were looking at themselves in this experience. These people were taking walks, which are so good for them. They were spending time with their family because most families have off during Black Friday. They were, you know, actually appreciating nature, which is not an infinite resource that we should respect and love. They were helping individuals set personal goals in their own lives, i.e. I'm going to respect nature more. I'm going to spend time with my family. I'm going to opt outside on this date next year, already setting that opportunity for year after year, which probably was ended up permeating in other parts of their life, which probably, I would say, inspired them to think about nature differently, to think about their family differently and time with their family, to think about how much money they're actually spending. That one campaign, that one experience. And if you actually look at the opt outside hashtag, it was thousands and thousands of people sharing their personal stories based on these goals that were able to be set by REI. That's a big action that I think makes a lot of sense. But now looking at the questions that I would ask, it would be, what are the goals that we're setting as an internal organization that is actually transforming ourselves? What are the goals that we're standing for for our audience and how are we actually asking our audience to think differently about themselves and the world? How are we using language that can transform individuals' lives, not just sell a product? By the way, this will automatically sell a product because you're not just focused on the sale, you're focused on something more meaningful, and that's where this brand loyalty comes in, which we'll talk even more about on the seventh level. Critical engagement, how can you work with it? So how can you identify who within your audience is in level six? And how can you increase engagement with your audience even more? Folks who are at this level are super engaged with your brand in a way that goes beyond the product or service you're selling. This is the bridge to brand loyalty. Your audience feels emotionally connected to you, but there's still room to help them feel inspired, empowered, and cared for as individuals. To engage your audience at this level requires very attentive listening skills in every department at your company. Now let's break out into listening and what that looks like. So listening is one of the most important things you can do as a brand. Listening requires you to have the tools to listen. It requires you to have the patience to listen. It requires you to have the team to listen. And this is starting within your own company. If you don't have the space to listen within your own organization, you're not listening to each other, you're probably not going to be able to listen to your audience. And they will sense that and they will feel that. So in this capacity, having the social tools, the listening tools, the regular questions, the being able to, again, truly know all of the individual aspects of each and every single customer at these top levels, at this top of the funnel, and then delivering time and time again. So once you have identified those needs, once you've listened to them, once you've get, you get a full picture of them as a human being, that's when you can speak to them from a very personal perspective. And being able to do that is that highest level. So knowing them, is a much larger process. And again, it takes a lot longer than if you were to just, again, engage them by asking them to comment or like. You're knowing their passions, you're knowing their stories, you're knowing their narratives, and you can do this in a mul multitude of ways. You can actually do this through social campaigns. You can do this through user-generated content of, hey, we want you to be sharing your stories all of the time. That is could be a part of your entire content strategy. Share who you are with us. Share who you are with us for sweepstakes. Share who you are with us for to be featured on our website. Share who you are with us to, you know, come to inbound for free, share who you are with us to give a talk as a part of our academy, whatever it is, the more opportunities you can ask people to share who they are, the more you're keeping them at that highest level of engagement because that requires them to look inside themselves, identify their story, and connect it with yours. And that is the highest level of engagement. So listen, ask a lot of questions, and use that opportunity to listen as a mechanism to create content because that's the best opportunity possible. You're actually asking your audience to share who they are, and that's what they want to do anyway. To measure success at this level, look at the metrics that show your brand is helping others. For example, one great thing to look for to find out whether you're helping your customers is online reviews and testimonials. 
Thanks to social media and online review sites, it's easier than ever to find what your customers are writing about you in these reviews and testimonials. Some of the more common review sites that you want to monitor are Yelp, Facebook, Google, Amazon, and Better Business Bureau. There are also industry-specific review sites that you should claim if they're popular within your business's vertical, such as TripAdvisor and Oyster in the travel and hospitality industries, G2 Crowd and Finances Online in the software industries, and OpenTable and Happy Cow in the restaurant industries. Monitoring and measuring the ratings and reviews you're getting on these sites will help you make educated decisions about what should stay the same and what needs to change in order for you to help your customers be as successful as possible. You'll also want to make sure you're proactively asking for reviews from your happy customers. Here at HubSpot, we tested out a number of different channels for collecting reviews. Ultimately, the most effective channels for collecting reviews for us were email, events, and triggering reviews based on product usage. We also found that rewarding people for leaving a review worked really well. For example, at HubSpot, we ran an A-B test on email to find out if rewards would make customers more likely to review us. For the enabled group, we offered a $10 Amazon gift voucher to the first 10 people who reviewed us. For the control group, we used the same design and almost identical copy, but removed mentions of the reward. The chance of a small reward boosted our review numbers by a staggering 733%. Despite the huge increase in the quantity of reviews being left, the high quality of reviews being left didn't change. Normally, our conversion rate for review email sends stands at around 3%, but when a reward was offered, it jumped to 25%. Being able to, I think, create a campaign, a concept around these goals is the easiest way to communicate them, but you can also communicate them based on a values document, having a series of values on your website and then using those values in the way you work with partners, in the way you work with clients, in the way you work with customers, inspiring them to set values in their own lives. So it can be as little a little as a campaign, an external marketing campaign, or it can be as big as how you start from the foundational work as a company to be able to set your own goals. Level seven, literate thinking. Finally, we've reached the very highest level in the seventh level engagement framework. Level seven, literate thinking. Literate thinking means your audience is engaged with you on an emotional level and feels like you as a brand are identifying their personal values and beliefs and their stories and creating a brand experience that inspires and empowers them as individuals. Now we're going to be talking about the seventh level of engagement, literate thinking. When I actually talk about the seven levels, because I usually don't have an hour with people, I really just jump to the seventh level. And I say that all brands are striving for the seventh level. And people usually say, what does that even mean? And to me, the best brands in the world have been able to reach the seventh level. That being said, doesn't mean that they're at the seventh level for all customers, but they have a large proportionate group of customers in this seventh level, which will keep them not only surviving, but thriving. I'm going to give an example of a child, and then I'm going to give a few more examples with this because this is my favorite one. I, I took a favorite. So with a child... If you're in a class, and I, I use the guidance camp counselor example, but this is different. So if you're in a class as a kid and you do have ADHD uh, and you're distracted and you're all over the place and, and you're really not able to focus, a lot of teachers are unbelievably stressed. They have you know 30 students in their classroom. It's very difficult for them to be able to sit down with each and every student and identify their needs and support them with that growth. But if a teacher could spot that, that child, like what happened with Steve Jobs and his teacher who ended up changing his whole life, that teacher could actually work one-on-one -on -one with that individual or create lessons based on the ADHD. So if it's focused on if he, you know, if he or she is constantly moving in a seat or, or you know, or in her seat and they never really want to stay still and that teacher could actually create a lesson, same lesson that everyone else is learning in math based on the kid being able to run in the outdoors and learn how to use their body for a math lesson. That is actually tapping into that child, identifying the personal values and beliefs, the story of that child, creating a lesson that really inspires that child to then be able to take action in his or her own life.
That is the highest form of engagement. When you actually can have someone not only learn, but be inspired to learn, even if they have things in their way. So when it comes to marketing, the best brands that do this create messaging that is not even about their product. When you as an individual is at a place in your mind where you are even deciding to pull from your personal values and beliefs, and that is when a brand inspires you to do that. I love SoulCycle. That's a brand to me that has done this tremendously well. When you walk into a soul cycle, there's nothing really about how good you're going to look or how hot you're going to be. It's all about how you're going to feel inside, that you're going to be able to ignite your soul, that you're going to be a part of a tribe, that you're going to be inspired, that you're going to be ignited after this experience. If you ever go into a soul cycle, soul cycle is a cycling class that was acquired by Equinox, which is a big luxury gym, uh, and they're all over the world now. And if you go into a soul cycle class, there's words on the wall that actually is like their manifesto, their mantra as you're riding these bikes. Now, this is just a bike class. I mean, why is this so empowering and inspiring? It's because they've been able to create a message that allows for me to pull from my own personal values and beliefs and align with their brand. Literate thinking, how can you work with it? So how do you identify who is at this highest level of engagement and how do you keep them there? To bring your audience from critical engagement to the top level literate thinking, you'll need to connect with them in a way that makes them love your brand so much that they'll one, willingly act as brand ambassadors to their network and two, reciprocate their loyalty by giving back to your brand. For example, by giving reviews. Having as much of your audience as possible in this bucket is the goal, yes, but it takes a lot of work to keep them there. Happy customers are a marketer's secret weapon for growth. In a world where the internet is overloaded with content, people remain hyper-focused on customer reviews. Businesses report that word of mouth is their single best source of referrals. Every marketer should be allocating significant time to speaking with customers and truly listening to what they have to say. You'll get more leverage from case studies, customer testimonials, and video interviews than you'll ever get from a marketing author blog post or an email. Marketers need to think about how they can help turn more customers into active promoters, and those active promoters into content creators. In terms of an example of a company that kind of created a program for level seven. We work with a vitamins company. It's a children's vitamins company and it's children's parents, but it's gummies. Um, and they were having problems connecting, increasing their Instagram following. That was really their, their focus. And what we came to them with was how do we create a story that's about your community? They had a very engaged, they had a very um, connected community. They had all these different individuals that wanted to share on behalf of their brand, but they actually weren't giving them the tools to do so based on the goal that they wanted, which was an Instagram following. And so we put together a strategy that was all around asking their community to share their stories. And we put paid against it, targeting the right people to also share their stories. We put influencers and micro influencers to share their stories all again with the same goal. We had a sweepstakes with integrated partners that stood for the values of their brand, where if people shared the stories, they were able to actually win the sweepstakes. You can see based on all of this, the sweepstakes was structure dependent. The self-regulated interest were the influencers and micro, micro influencers. We had different multiple points. The messaging and the targeting was to ensure that we were not in a position of one, two, or three. We were reaching the right audience on the right platform. We were focused on Instagram because that was where they felt their audience was based on research and analysis. And what we ended up getting for them was level seven. We got a thousand plus submissions on Instagram of people sharing their own stories on their social media platforms, which even though a thousand doesn't sound a lot, it's a lot when it's people sharing personal narrative on their own social platforms. And their goal was 4,000 Instagram followers in three months, real followers that would stick. And we actually acquired 8,000. So in that short period of time, we looked at the different levels, identified, you know, actions that would be able to increase that, you know, that, fo that follower count, but based on the, levens, the level seventh principle, which was this idea of asking people to share their own stories on behalf of the brand. That's an example of what a successful seventh level campaign can look like. 
Let's break down some of the key metrics that'll help you identify who in your audience is at this highest level of engagement. Three metrics we recommend measuring at this level are Net Promoter Score, or NPS, customer retention, and the performance of your customer loyalty program. Net Promoter Score, or NPS, is a customer satisfaction benchmark that measures how likely your customers are to recommend you to a friend or colleague. This is a typical benchmark that companies measure to evaluate and improve customer loyalty. To calculate NPS, send a survey to your customers, asking them, on a scale of 0 to 10, how likely are you to recommend our brand to a friend or colleague? Categorize the respondents according to their score. Scores 0 through 6 are detractors, scores 7 and 8 are passives, and scores 9 and 10 are promoters. Promoters are enthusiastic, loyal customers who will tell their friends about your business and bring in new customers. Passives are indifferent and could become promoters, or they could switch to your competition. Detractors are unhappy customers, and not only are you at risk of losing them, but they could do damage to your brand by sharing their bad experiences with other people. Disregard the passives who represent the middle ground and subtract the percentage of detractor responses from the percentage of promoter responses. That score is your net promoter score and can range from negative 100 to 100. So what's a good net promoter score, you might ask? Technically, any score above zero can be considered a good score since that implies that you have more promoters than detractors. 50 and above is excellent and 70 and above is the best of the best, although achieving either of these is both outstanding and rare. Now let's switch gears to customer retention. Your customer retention is your company's ability to retain customers over a period of time. To calculate customer retention rate, take the number of customers you have at the end of a given time period minus the number of customers you acquired during that same time period. Divide that number by the number of customers you had at the start of that period. Take the resulting number and multiply it by 100. Customer retention is important to any growing company because it measures not only how successful you are at acquiring new customers, but also how successful you are at satisfying existing customers. Only a 5% increase in customer retention can increase company revenue by 25 to 95%. Why? Because it's easier and more cost effective to retain customers than to acquire new ones and returning customers spend more, buy more often, and refer friends and family. How about customer loyalty programs? A customer loyalty program is simply a rewards program offered by a company to customers who frequently make purchases, rewards like free merchandise, coupons, or even an early glance at upcoming new products. Customer loyalty programs are a great way to retain customers, and the health of these programs can give you a great idea of how engaged your customers are at the highest levels. One report found that 28% of consumers are abandoning loyalty programs without redeeming any points, and over half, 54%, of loyalty memberships are inactive. One reason for this is that many of today's loyalty programs try to buy consumer loyalty through monetary rewards only. This is an unhelpful approach to loyalty programs. So if you're finding similar results, think about what kind of emotional connection you're trying to foster with your customers and how well that's actually working. With this customer loyalty program, having a whole set of goals around that, whether that be brand advocacy, um, and brand being brand ambassadors, I have user-generated content as a big part of this seventh level. Uh, when we've done campaigns in the past, most brands are thinking again of the comments and the likes, but I would prefer, and I think most brands are like, oh, there's no way this is going to work for customers to share stories on behalf of the brand. And this is that seventh level where a person is actually sacrificing their own brand to share on behalf of your brand story. And the best brands in the world don't even have to ask the individuals to share. They will just share on behalf of your brand because they actually consider it a part of their identity. That's how, you know, strong of an opportunity this is to connect with customers in this way. So if you were to learn anything from these seven levels, the thing that I would really want you to, to understand is the seventh level is what every brand is striving for, but it's unbelievably difficult to be able to get to without recognizing all of the work that it takes to get there. That to me is 
will you marry me? And that's not how most brands are thinking. And that is where I would like for us to have a more nuanced approach to the way we're talking to human beings. So when it comes to keeping people at this high level of engagement, it's all about aligning your brand with your audience's personal values and beliefs. Know what your audience believes in, what they stand for, and what messaging they'll connect with, and create marketing campaigns that center around those themes. Everyone brings up Apple, but Steve Jobs originally actually ran a two-page ad in a newspaper describing the technology of Apple, literally two pages, all text about the product. Did not do well, obviously. Then he started working with Pixar and ended up really realizing the power of storytelling. And then he came up with the concept of think different. And so think different was this idea of being able to identify the creative genius in each and every single one of us, being able to tap into a part of ourselves that we actually were able to pull out of ourselves because of this simple message, think different. And then we wanted to be loyal to the brand, to an Apple, to a computer because of what it represented, not because of what it was selling. Summarizing the top four levels of engagement. So there you have it, the top four levels of engagement. In the engage stage of the inbound methodology, you have level four, structure-dependent engagement, where your audience is taking structured instructional actions, but is not taking action organically. And level five, self-regulated interest, where your audience is engaging with your brand purely for self-interested reasons. Then, in the delight stage, you have level six, critical engagement, where your audience is engaged with you on an emotional level and believes that your brand understands and cares about their goals in a way that goes beyond the product and allows for brand loyalty. And finally, level seven, literate thinking, where your audience is engaged with you on an emotional level and feels like you as a brand are identifying their personal values and beliefs and their story and creating a brand experience that inspires and empowers them as an individual. The more emotionally connected your audience is with your brand, the more engaged they are in the seventh level engagement framework. The more emotionally connected and engaged they are, the more likely they are to become repeat customers and brand advocates. We've only touched on some of the more common ways of measuring engagement at these levels. Now it's time for you to think about the metrics for success that your business should measure for each one of these levels. Take a moment to think about what you've learned in the context of your own business. What are the best ways for you to measure whether your audience consumes your content passively? What are the best ways for you to measure whether your audience is engaged by or confused by your messaging? With an understanding of what each level of engagement means and looks like, you can start to piece together how and where to test with your audience and find places to improve your relationship. By knowing these levels exist, you're actually thinking of your customer differently and you're, you're starting to realize that they don't just fall into one or the other bucket. And also you start to think of your customer in this nuanced approach, like a human being. And so you don't also just give up on them if they're not interested in your product. You really can use the understanding of these levels to keep you know, moving forward with your customer, even if they are frustrated or even if they are in a position where they're disengaged. Um, you have this knowledge and expertise to know that they're not a lost cause.